Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about having a bold personality, an expansive personality, that sort of stuff. And first I want to draw you your attention to an essay by Carl Jung called Marriage as a Psychological Relationship. And he talks in that essay um, about a container personality and a contained personality within the context of marriage. So you'll have one person who is the slightly simpler personality, and then, then you'll have one person who is the, the slightly more complex personality. Now, of course, this can work in a, in a variety of, of grad gradients or shades, let's say, because, of course, there's there may be two people who are somewhat uh, not that complex personalities that are within marriage, of course, but of course, one of them is going to be slightly more complex than the other, and so then that person would be the contained in that specific marriage. But then you might have another marriage where it's quite obvious the split between the container and the contained, where you've got a very, very simple personality and then a very, very expansive personality, a very, very complex personality. And um, so this kind of goes along this idea of a big bold, expansive personality. And what we're kind of going to be drawing upon or talking about in this video is the more extreme version of that. You would say that I am more of an expansive personality in the extreme version. Um, other people as well, there's many other people out there who fit that kind of more, slightly more on the, the upper end of what it means to be an expansive personality. But then you've got obviously these, these gradients as well. Now, Carl Jung in the essay basically touched upon a few of the issues with regards to um, the container and the contained within um, a marriage situation. I'm not going to go into that specifically um, because I want to kind of touch upon just generally the kind of having an expansive personality um, and what that kind of means and what that entails and what um, how you can somewhat atone with that personality as well if you have quite an expansive personality. But I do want to say something uh, that I picked up in the essay, which Jung basically said that certain people are bestowed um, a certain differentiation in the instincts that compels them to be this personality, to be this big, bold personality. Now, in archetypal terms, you might relate that to certain archetypes. You could say, the archetype of the, the jester or the joker, uh, you could relate it to the archetype of the sage, you could certainly relate it to the archetype of the child. Whether there is, let's say there's some instinctual differentiation of, as a basis within that individual for those specific archetypes or those specific patterns of instinctual behaviour, but then maybe it's been socialised in a little bit more through um, childhood and all the rest of it. Um, and then that means that, of course, that that personality has um, become, let's say, having these associations, which means that, which means that obviously that personality really is expansive and and uh, bold and big, and possibly also uh, we could um, put eccentric into this. Although it doesn't necessarily need to be placed in this the word eccentric, but because there could be ex expansive personalities that maybe aren't quite eccentric, but they are quite um, varied in their interests, in their intellectual curiosity, in maybe their aesthetic interests and things like that. Um, but often when we get to the more extreme personality, the extreme expansive personality, eccentricity rears its head anyway. So he talks about this idea of this differentiation in the instincts to create this, this uh, um kind of this more expansive personality, which also he does talk about, I believe he, I don't know whether he uses this word specifically, but he at least kind of draws your attention to it. And he, he talks about how this could possibly be a little bit of a burden on someone having such an expansive personality. Now, if we relate this, this just general idea to our modern understanding of personality within the five factor model of a big five, specifically as I always talk about in trait openness and the reason I talk about trait openness so much is simply because I'm high, very high in trait openness. Now if you had someone high in trait conscientiousness and they were a psychologist they'd probably end up relating it to conscientiousness or whatever or another trait because that's the thing that they're 
they understand the best because that's what they're hiring. So I just do it based on that, really. Um, but trait openness does have a genetic component to it. And it's, as I've talked about before, it's around the 50% mark. So you've got, we've got in this modern understanding of personality, this idea of trait openness, which is directly relating to intellectual curiosity, aesthetic interest, imagination and creativity, these kind of things that also go hand in hand with eccentricity, go hand in hand with especially in the idea of intellectual curiosity, um, the inquisitive instinct, which I've talked about before, relates to the sage archetype. And so we can see that being born out of that. And we can also see, you know, within dress sense and within uh, aesthetic interest and other things within trait openness, we can also see sort of a side to this expansive personality, this almost instinctual uh, personality that Jung's talking about. Um, and certainly there is, we may argue somewhat whether there's an instinctual differentiated basis for um, that particular uh, kind of personality, but we may not argue that it isn't genetic or isn't in part genetic because certainly there is a genetic component there within trait openness. So that's quite interesting. And this, I don't know exactly when Marriage is a Psychological Relationship was published, but of course Jung died in 1961. And so I, I've, it was probably 30, 40, 50, something around that, you know, maybe in those 20, 30 years around that sort of time. Um, and so it's very interesting because of course the, the, um, ideas of, um, uh, the Big Five Personality and the Five Factor Model didn't come around until, well, they got published around 1992. Uh, of course, there may have been a bit of work and thinking about it slightly prior to that. Um, but you can see how Jung's cottoned on to these ideas and he's kind of had this understanding of this, how kind of trait openness works a little bit, way, way before it even happened. And he's related it to the instincts which uh, is, is a remarkable idea in itself. Just in that one essay, I mean, it's genius. Um, the other thing that about Jung, slightly getting off topic just for a minute, but I want recognition of this because it seems in Jungian psychology, this isn't really talked about that much as a, as a good idea, as a really, you know, fundamental, really good idea. But Jung had this idea and he talks about it in another essay. I, I forgot the name of the essay. Oh, it is the love problem of a student, I believe. That was the essay. All of these essays are in the book Aspects of the Feminine, uh, Aspects of the Feminine, which is um, basically a compilation of, of certain different uh, ones of Jung's essays. So it's in the love problem of a student, and he touches upon this idea, and it's a genius idea. It's probably one of the most genius ideas in Jungian psychology, and it doesn't get talked about that much. And it's the idea of psychic puberty. And I've touched upon it very briefly, I think, in the Jung video, in the introduction to Jungian psychology that I did. But it's a counterpart. It's a psychic counterpart to physiological puberty. I mean, it's genius. It's absolute genius. And it just doesn't get talked about that much. Um, but anyway, going back to the topic. Um, so I really want to uh, look into, actually, psychic puberty, just to finish on that from an empirical standpoint myself, but also if I can find some more information on it by Jung, because there's probably little bits of writings he's done on it elsewhere. Um, I don't think it's in archetypes or anything. I'm, I'm not I'm not certain. I don't think it is, though, um, because it is kind of like a specialist thing, that really, isn't it? And it fits very, very well into the love problem of a student. He might have mentioned it here or there, like he might have put the phrase in here or there to certain ones of his books, but I don't know whether there's actually the same level of detail talking about it as there is in The Love Problem of a Student. And even so, he doesn't go into major, major detail on it. I'd really like a, a good, maybe an S, like a full essay outlining psychic puberty and the exact stages of it and all the rest of it. And he talks about, as I say, a little bit in The Love Problem of a Student, but not like crazy, crazy, crazy. And I'd, so I don't know, I might, I might want to read that essay again and, and, you know, see if I can pick pick out a little bit more uh, gold from that. Um, but yeah, that is a really interesting conception. But anyway, getting back to this expansive um, personality. 
So I wanted to talk about how people can live with this personality. Now I say live with and I say and I don't say the word atone with specifically. Atone with might work. Certainly you couldn't say unify. How can someone unify an expansive personality? Unfortunately, I don't believe, based on having one of these personalities myself and observing other people with these personalities, I don't really believe that you can unify it fully. And Jung also touches upon this in the uh, Marriage is a Psychological Relationship, in which he basically touches upon this idea of unity and this idea of the container wanting to find some sort of unity, but always kind of not being able quite to find it because it's somewhat of an infantile desire. And I do believe that as well, based on my experience. I don't believe that an expansive personality can unify completely. I think they can get a very good understanding of how expansive their personality is. I think they can get a good ex understanding of the ways in which their personality works and the different facets with their personality. And they can kind of atone somewhat with their personality and kind of get an acceptance, a general acceptance of the different ways in which their personality expresses itself. But to find some level of unity, I, I, I don't, you know, some sort of whole, full unity in such an expansive personality, I think that's a very, very, very hard task. And I think it's one that um, is quite kind of coloured with a little bit of childish expectation, psychologically speaking, in which you really desire that unity, you desire that wholeness, you desire that full completeness within your personality but unfortunately it's so expansive your personality that you just can't fully get there um and i think that there's kind of when we have let's say when we take a single moment when we take a single moment in time or a, let's say a single short experience in your life a, a single two minute experience or 30 second experience or 10 second experience, you have within that experience and you present a part of your personality. Now, if you're a simpler personality, what Jung would refer to as a simpler personality, uh, i.e. not quite as complex as, as, let's say, a very, very expansive personality, then you may be able to understand in your words, in your action and in your demeanor within that short 30 second or two minute or 10 second experience, if you were to dissect it, you may be able to see and understand more of your personality than, let's say, the expansive person. But you still wouldn't, even if you're a simpler personality, be able to understand your full personality in that single short little uh, amount of time. And with the more expansive personality, there's no hope of doing that. There's literally no hope of being able to, in if you were to dissect your personality in a short experience, be able to say, oh, that's my entire personality. So if you're always going through life like that, if you're going through life having different experiences throughout the day with different people, and you're going through it, and you're having experiences with you with yourself, and you're having um, and you're and you're doing different things. You're partaking in different behaviors, all the rest of it. Then you can't ever, in a single short period, understand your entire personality because it's too expansive. Anyone's personality is, whether you're a simpler personality or whether you're an expansive personality, you cannot understand wholly in a short time period or or a single moment even your entire personality. So therefore, any attempt of of full unity or wholeness is in vain. Even if, let's say, you're to try and to dissect your personality and to place it into different um, categories of perception. So this is what I've done. I've placed my personality into different categories of perception. And there's, and of course, somewhat of this I base on the archetypes because that's the way I see certain things coming through in my personality. But we could also just refer to certain perceptual changes within your personality throughout the day. 
So, for example, with my own personality, just as a perception on personality, let's say, which you could relate this to the archetypes in the collective unconscious, but just as a, as an within the ego, my perceptions of myself change throughout the day, as as do all our perceptions. Now, some of us are slightly unconscious of that and aren't really aware of it, and some of us are more aware of it, and some of us have more changes in perceptions on our personality, and other people have less, and that's just based on the complexity of our personalities. So with me, sometimes throughout the day, I will think of, I will have the perception come into my mind quite naturally, it'll just bleed into my experience of, of myself and the surroundings, and it may come up through um, a certain meeting with a with a certain stimulus or stimuli, or you know, a set of stimuli, um, or it may um, it may come up. It might just kind of arise naturally that certain perception at some point during the day. Uh, and so sometimes I'll think of myself and I'll be in this perception of an old woman. Other times I'll be in the perception of an old man. And so when so to give you an idea of what what I mean by this because it might be quite confusing if you don't have these changes in perception. So when I'm in my old man mentality, I'll be very philosophical, I'll be very reserved and and you, you might not necessarily see this in my behavior particularly, but I'm, what I'm meaning is I'll feel philosophical in my mind, I'll feel that and I'll feel reserved. And I also feel quite conservative when I'm in that like if we're talking about political ideology, I'll also feel quite conservative in that mindset and I'll be very, I, and it does affect my action because I will be quite slow and I will be quite considered and that's that certain personality perception coming into my mind. Now, if I'm feeling like the old woman, I feel quite, um, the best way to relate it to someone, I don't know whether you saw it because some people watching this will be older than me, but if you've ever seen the show with um, Lisa Barron, uh, who who played Auntie Mabel in Come Outside with the little dog Pippin, where they used to fly in the plane, and you can type it in Google, Come Outside, if you haven't watched it, just to see. The demeanour of Auntie Mabel on that show is how I feel, it, in my mind, as a perception. I feel as if I am her, in my mind, and I have certain perceptions uh, and my perception is like that and then my behavior could so be said to change subtly because I've got that perception. Now there's other perceptions that come through in the idea of ads so um, and I do label all these by the way to compartmentalize and to understand myself as a expression of all of these different things put together so I, I whenever I'm a old woman I think to myself oh that's Mabel coming through and I named her after Auntie Mabel whenever I'm the old man I call I call him Cruifni because there was an asteroid that circles the the earth I think it circles it in a very bizarre shape like a horseshoe shape or whatever and uh I, I did some research on like, god 10 years ago or more I don't know when I would just I used to when I was a kid because I didn't like doing schoolwork, I'd just go on Wikipedia and just type in loads of random things and just learn different things. So I, I, obviously it was 10 years ago, so I can't remember exactly what this asteroid was. All I remember is it's called Corifne, this astro asteroid, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but I, I probably definitely am pronouncing that wrong. Um, it's C-U... Uh, sorry, C R U I T H N E, I believe, um, and it circles the Earth like once every few thousand years, and I think it does like a kind of horseshoe shape. If I remember the Wikipedia page correctly, but you know, I can't see the Wikipedia page quite in my mind because it was like ten years ago. Um, but anyway, so um, uh, so there was uh, Kriffney, and that's the old man. That's the, the kind of well, you could say in Jungian terms, that's the wise old man, the mana figure of the wise old man coming through. Also, Mabel, you could say in in archetypal or Jungian terms, is the mana figure of the wise old woman. And so, therefore, we could say that I somewhat associate with dual mana figures, which is very very interesting. And I've speculated that um, in gender fluid individuals. Um, or, specific, or maybe even like non-binary individuals, how they have dual mana figures at the stage of individuation. So when they get to individuation, they have 
in their mind, they, although for a lot of people, for me, it's very, very conscious because I've introspected so much. But for most people, these perceptions on personality are quite unconscious and they don't even, some people, not everyone, but some people I, I would suspect don't even realize they're having these perceptions, but they are in some regard. Um, and then there's other people who are kind of semi-conscious of them and kind of feel them. And then there's other people who are really conscious of them. So yeah, I call him Kruifni. And of course, whenever I'm in that instinctual, and it is a very instinctual mode of being silly and being f funny and playing little jokes on people and stuff, which could align with the joker archetype or the jester archetype, um, I, I call that ads, and I have called that ads for years anyway. It's very odd that I've I've kind of made that association. So that's ads. And then, well, I think, well, if I'm more, if I'm, uh, you know, more shadowy or if I'm kind of feeling, if I've got a perception on reality that's like, um, you know, sit back, being quite rebellious. And I do this sometimes in the flat. I'll have this kind of perception that comes in. And, it, you know, I'll, it'll orient my behaviour somewhat and I'll be, and, that, and that's bad, that's the rebellious, that's the, I'm going to sit back, I'm, you know, you know, and it's all, all, also associated slightly with the animus as well, like in archetypal terms, um, but more so it's, it's my kind of shadow personality. And so that's bad and that's a certain perception on my uh, personality. Now, if we're removing the Jungian idea from this, what we could say is that bad is just simply a certain perception on my personality that comes into the ego, as I say, based on an external uh, stimulus or just arising naturally from, from within. And it doesn't necessarily need to be affiliated or associated with the Jungian tradition. I'm just doing so because that's the way I've started to understand it more. Um, so then that's bad. Now, there's another dimension of experience, which I'm working on at the moment, which comes through, but I, I've not got complete consciousness of this. It's hard to understand, but there's a dimension of experience that, that is like between bads. Uh, well, no, it's like, it's like almost a combination of bads and ads in a way. And, it, and it's around here. And I call him Zarino Bands, which is a um, anagram of Ads Robinson. Now, when I've got this perception, this is very interesting, and this is very, very close to who I actually am as a as an individual, or no, rather, who I like to think I am. And this side of myself, Zarino Bands, directly relates to a certain shade of the animus, and he's charming and he's confident and he's got all of those things that you associate with someone who is let's say a gentleman in a bar who is quite charming and he walks up to a woman and all that sort of stuff you know and, and he's very kind of comfortable in in himself and he's not necessarily trying to be anything but he is just this charming individual who is like that and so there's a shade to be animus to it because there's this little philosophical twang to it only minorly but there's also this kind of uh heroic maybe subtly overbearing nature as well because Zarina also can be quite overbearing can be quite blunt can be quite um He's not bad particularly, although he kind of almost bleeds into bads a little bit. There's like kind of a little bit of bleeding in there that, that goes on. But Zarino is, um, he's kind of like got this little charm to him. He's a little bit cheeky, um, but also there's a, there's a minor little bit of, of a philosophical twang in there as well. And he, he is the charmer. Zarino is the charmer. That's what I'm trying to say. He's like the, um, the very uh, archetypal lover, let's say, but I don't mean the lover in the sense of um, sexual love. I mean the lover in the sense of charming love and, you know, that Prince Charming type idea. And, and that falls into the animus, but it also associates with, with the hero a little bit. Um, and so when I say, I suppose when I say that he's kind of 
a mix between ads and bads. I think that there's certainly bits of bads within him, but I think that maybe not so much ads, maybe more so Adam, maybe more so me as a as a whole person that bleeds into him. Um, so there's, it's like a mix between bads and Adam, really. But the thing is, I have a problem with this conception of Adam. And I know it's very weird because to me, I don't exist. Adam doesn't exist as a whole personality. The way I see it is that I am an I am a formulation. Adam, the, the Adam that you see, is a formulation of all of these different perceptions, um, kind of melting together to form one experience. And so, and this is where we start to get into, I suppose, more of a Jungian idea, because a Jungian idea of the archetypes bleeding into one another to form an individualized personality, that, that is a very kind of Jungian idea. But I see myself as these things all bleeding into one another and kind of um, and uh, and then creating a certain experience on reality that I have now so right now I am portraying like a, a few of these different uh, sub personalities but in one experience that we could consider as directed and whole so for example uh, I am a little bit of Kerifni but I'm also a little bit of Zorino, not too much at all at this time period. I'm I'm certainly a little bit of Mabel. I feel a little bit of Mabel right now. And I do feel a little bit of ads, but only a tiny bit. You see, Zorino right now is probably one of the weakest. You've got Kerifni, who's, you know, a little bit stronger. You've got ads, who is, you know, again, maybe slightly to the weaker side. And then you've got Mabel, who's a little bit stronger in what I kind of feel. And, and also you've got Oh, I didn't mention one. I know who I am more so right now. I'm I'm Antalia. I didn't mention Antalia. So Antalia is the young woman. So she's the uh, Antalia is basically here's what it is. Zorino Bands becomes Kruifni, and Antalia becomes Mabel. What I mean by that is imagine that in my mind I've got. Um, Zorino and um, Kruifni, and I've got um, Antalia and Mabel, and those are the same people. Kruifni, Kruifni and Zorino are the same person at different levels in their life. Kruifni is the old, philosophical, reserved, con conservative man who's very, you know, centred and very inquisitive and very... Um, has a lot of, sag sag I can never say that word, never pronounce it, sagacity, there we go, has a lot of sagacity, is very uh, sagacious. Um, uh, whereas Zorino is his younger counterpart. So Zorino has a bit of a philosophical nature, but he's more kind of charming, he's got a little bit of a twinkle in the eye, he's also a little bit heroic, he's, he's also a little bit uh, overbearing as well, to a certain degree. Um, so that, so he becomes Kerifni, and then Antalia is the very, very insecure, you know, woman who's young, who um, who hasn't had much experience, she's quite introverted, she's quite literary, she's quite um, kind of, uh, you know, intellectual, but she's kind of quite closed off and quite reserved and in need of a, of a saviour of a man, let's say. Um, so that's Antalya, and she grows up to be Mabel, you see. So Mabel is the the um, kind of the, uh, personality who is Antalya, but is more strong. So Mabel and Kruifni are a strong, wise old man, wise old woman, that are paired to Zorino and, and um, Antalya. And Zorino, of course, you could say, well, I mean, this is, this is just going off into a fantasy now. I mean, it's not even like this is anything real, but... Zorino, you could say, is the person who needs to uh, attain Antalya in a, in a relationship because he is the animus and she's the anima, essentially. Or a immature, they're both the immature versions of the anima and the animus. And then Kerifni and Mabel are the mana uh, anima animus. They're the mana personalities of the anima and the animus. Um, and so they're more mature and, and etc. Um, so 
you know, thought, I don't see Adam. I don't have, I don't think, well, yeah, I'm Adam. I don't, I don't think that. I think that's bizarre for anyone to think that they are who they are. That's a, weird, that's a conception that I just don't understand. Like, do people actually think that? Do they think that they are, like, John? Or they think they're bloody Patrick or something? It's like, what? We okay? Well, you're gonna think that because you're. I think you're. I think if you looked into yourself, you're way more expansive than that. But oh, okay, even simpler personalities are more expansive than that. Um. So when you see me, so I'm on. So I am probably actually quite a lot of Antalya. So really, right now, my perception is Antalya, a little bit of Mabel at the same time, because these can bleed into one another quite quite considerably. And you can also. There's also another experience that happens to sit between Antalya and Mabel, which is like a, a motherly-like figure. That's like a motherly-like figure. It's weird. But you have Antalya, and then you have Mabel, and then there's like this almost motherly perception I can sometimes gain, which is in between the two. Um, although Mabel is quite motherly in her characterization anyway. Now, between Zarino and between Kriffney, because I have... Uh, uh, not as strong relationship with my masculinity as other people. I can see, and I've I've seen it in dreams actually, m remarkably enough, that would actually typify this idea that I'm going to talk about. But I can't really perceive a father like there's. I can perceive Kriffney, and I, I have that perception. I have that perception in my mind. I am Kriffney at certain times, and. Then also, you know, there's Zorino there, and I and I'm starting to flesh out Zorino. I'm starting to, to starting to understand his perceptions within and um, within my not only his perceptions but his attitude within my behaviour. And I'm starting to get a better relationship with that side of my masculinity. But there's uh, also in between that there's this kind of father-like figure, but I've not got as much. I can't really see it as clearly, but I've seen it in dreams. I've, these kind of father-like figures have come up to me, and it's kind of as if it's Zarino, but grown up a little bit more. Because Zarino's still sort of my age. He's like my age, basically, is the way I perceive him. But there's like this figure that has come to me in dreams a few times over, in which he's like this man in his 40s or 50s, which is like Zorino in his 40s or 50s, which is very, very bizarre, but he has that same kind of behaviour, that same kind of charming nature, and that same kind of, um, I don't know, like, he's a little bit more philosophical than Zorino is right now, and he's more kind of, he is, like, charming, but he's got a subtle charm. Zorino has quite a, Zorino has a subtle charm, but he, he, he's still quite heavy on the charm in, in a way, in certain circumstances, but this further along idea of Zorino is like, he's got more subtle charm, and he's got, yeah, he, he's kind of like a really, he's slightly philosophical, and he's slightly heroic, he's a bit more heroic than Zorino, um, yeah, and 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 so there's there's that kind of thing in between them, and it's it's odd, and I and I'm I'm just pulling it out of the unconscious slowly, and I'm as I say I've seen this in dreams as well, so I know there's some reality to that kind of um, figure there. So that's kind of when I talk about an expansive personality, that gives you an idea of. I mean, of course, I'm just one on my own, you know, <laughs> I'm one on my own, <laughs> you know, I'm not, God, you know, it's as expansive as bloody me, um, but you could say that, you could say that, or you could say someone who's just generally bold, has a lot of intellectual interest, has a lot of, um, maybe, again, eccentricity comes into it. We see the expansive personality quite a lot within physicists. We see it also quite a lot within um Potentially certain writers as well. Certain writers can have quite an expansive personality. Um, we can see it as well um, within certain people within philosophy, although, you know, certain people, not all people. Um, and so I'm trying to think of maybe some other careers that you can really see this expansive personality in between between people, um, 
I'm try, I, I was trying to think of maybe some some good examples as well, but it's hard to think actually of some really good examples. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I can't quite think of some like solid solo examples of this in in you know like looking at uh, certain people in the world and certain um, uh, certain actors in the world. You know who actually did have quite an expansive personality? Um, Robin Williams. He he was very like instinctually expansive in his personality. Um, I don't know what is relationship with like for example intellectual curiosity or anything like that was um of, although it could be very very argued that he had a lot of emotional intelligence because he was very good at being able to understand reactions of people and things like that and be able to hit upon little things that he knew would work so he, he certainly had a lot of that but he was he typifies more of a an expansive personality in that regard. The only other thing, I suppose, you could you could look at fictional characters like Willy Wonka and things like that. He had very he has like a very expansive personality. Um, there's, there's loads of people, loads of famous people who have these expansive like loads. I mean, I'm talking at the more extreme end as well. Um, absolutely loads, but it's just at the moment I can't. You know, you, you know when your mind goes blank and you just can't really perceive certain individuals who have that but you'd be able to find them out easily yourself you'd be able to realize, oh actually that's what adam's on about and that's what i can see in that person and he has this a little bit more of this and and as i say it's not a one size fits all it's not that you have to have to be an expansive personality you'll be a container as young would say this kind of you know intellectual curiosity eccentricity this this and this but there's all different shades of of expansive personality as well um generally is it that an expansive personality does have um a little bit of eccentricity does have a little bit of intellectual curiosity yes generally but there's there's other things that that can go to it um and so it is hard to atone, as I mentioned, and, and we'll just get back to this to kind of finish off. So what do we, how can we help ourselves and how can we feel accepted by ourselves within our own personality? I think it's hard. I think it takes time. I think it takes a long time. I think that if you have such an expansive personality, I honestly don't think any time shy of about 40 or 35 or something like that and this draws upon the idea of individuation as well because individuation will come into this whether you've got an expansive personality or not but certainly if we're talking about an expansive personality here individuation is going to come into this and so I don't think that any time shy of about 35 40 or so you're going to really start to realize any level of feeling comfortable in your expansive personality I, I certainly don't I I I still struggle with the the very the big compulsions of ads or um certainly I've got a lot of atonement to do with bads as well there's a lot there that I need to go through and I mean there's a lot I've already bloody been through but there's a lot there I need to go through and and and, and bestow that into my conscious personality so to atone more with it um and then I think over, I think given another few years, I think maybe by the time I'm about 30, I'll, be, I'll have a better relationship with bads. And then once I've had a re better relationship with bads, that will open up the dimension of this, you know, talking about this kind of person in between Zoino and Corifni, that'll open up that person and I'll be able to see that person more. And I will actually start to become that person because that person is a potential, it's a fantasy based on a potential version of myself that could manifest in the future. Um, this is like the law of attraction stuff. You, you imagine these things, you envisage these things, and then you take the action to place that into reality. Um, so that is a, that kind of fathery figure type thing that I see who is like Zoino essentially, or one between Zoino and, and Coifni. We could actually give it another name rather than Zoino. Um, but that is kind of like uh, a part of myself when I am 40 or when I'm 45. And it's about manifesting that into my personality over the next few years. Now, uh, for it to get more wholeness, and that in itself gains 
more of a, 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 a structured completeness within these sub facets of the personality. Um, and so I, I don't think, I don't believe that you can get there really quickly with an expansive personality, but even if you've got not an expansive personality, because the thing is, your psyche bestows you certain um, perceptions on who you are, certain ideas of who you are, and you can start to envisage these ideas of who you, who you want to be in the future or who you think you're going to be in the future. And it bestows you that at certain times. It doesn't say to you when you're 10 years old, or it doesn't, or it doesn't give you a fantasy at 10 years old of someone who's 60, who, who you are. Of course, you may fantasize on that slightly, but it's never going to be accurate. What you need to do is you need to go into your unconscious and see these things working. And then slowly your unconscious, it, it almost, it, 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 it's almost as if it gives you a planned out fantasy plan, a planned out fantasy plan, a fantasy plan, let's say, of your life that then slowly reveals itself to you over the years and then actually implants itself in reality to a less exaggerated degree. So it won't be that I become that figure that I'm talking about that's a little bit unconscious to me at the moment. But I'll become, a, I'll, I'll partly become that figure in the context of my own individualized personality. I'll become a part of that. And I'll become a part, a little bit more of a part of Bads. I'll become a little bit more of a part of Mabel as I get older as well. That emotional, sensitive, lovely, older, woman-like figure. I'll become a bit more of that in my personality. I'll become a little bit more of Kuifni as well, be more more philosophical as I get older and that sort of thing. But I won't be solely them. It'll just be that all these things work very, very subtly within these fantasies over a long time period. And then it integrates me as a more rounded whole personality that is um, more mature as well, based on all these facets that are now, at the moment, being 25 and also over the last 10 years or so, that these things have been more shadowy and more, uh, with not you know, more in the unconscious and, and not really as mature as well. So it takes that time to be able to get to that personality. And that is what we call the mana personality, or we could also term it um, the mana figure of the superordinate personality, in which we have this rather, I, I this idea, this sort of perception, this figure on uh, within yourself of, that is your um, mature whole personality that's more cemented and more concrete and closer to what in the Jungian tradition they call the self, which is, as we, as we talked about before, the totality of one's personality. And that's how we we get there. That's how we express that. And so I do things all the time now. You see, it it, it, it may be funny to people because the people, I think, think that I do things just because I do them, but I don't. The whole rebrand of the channel, the whole me with the, the rainbow pocket square, I had a fantasy about that. And I knew that I needed to bring it into reality because it's another step closer to my full expression of individuation. Um, you see, I, I am refining ads at the moment. I'm starting to, from the fantasies, I'm starting to chuck away more of that childish side of ads and I'm replacing it with certain other ideas within my unconscious to get to a more refined whole personality. This branding that you see here, uh, Oh, and obviously, previous brandings that you've seen on the channel are also a circambulation. It's going back and forth and round and about, making mistakes and stuff until you get close to your whole total personality expressed in individuation. All of these things that have happened, whether I've been conscious of them or unconscious of, of them, have been methods of getting closer to this whole personality that is... Um, uh, that, that is concrete and cemented and that is um, also rooted in society. And all of these videos that I do now on philosophy and psychology, this goes towards in very, very tiny, tiny, fine incremental points. Um, it goes towards cementing me in society as a certain archetypal role, as a certain beacon uh, carrier of the flame of a certain archetype in an individualized setting. And I get to that when I'm around 50 odd. 
if we're going off the synchronous experiences I've had with the, the number 56, I would assume that my full individuation will come at 56. Um, and we'll see about that. And I think that that's probably a good time. I think 56 is a, a genius time period for, for individuation. I think that's a beautiful, I think it's spot on. Uh, I know some people would say, well, that's a quite old, actually, to be individuated, to be a whole personality. But I do. I think 56 is a good age for individuation. You see, individuation, yeah, it can happen at 40 or so or 45. But I think even at that age, your, your, your opposite psychic structure, let's say you're a man, you're anima, uh, there's still subtleties there that need to be worked through, even at, even at like 35, 40 or so, or even 45. Um, but when you get, it seems to be the 50s. It does. It seems to be, from what I've observed in people, it, the 50s are a crucial time uh, in which you flip into, over the early years of your 50s, you flip into the whole personality, you flip into that, and um, it's, it's um, that's where it lies, you know. So this branding, of course, and the rainbow pocket square and things like that, and the way that I've done the branding on the channel is getting me closer. You see, there's a lot of Zerino as well, or that, you know, that that father figure I was talking about in between Zerino and Griffney, there's a lot of that guy in the banner of this channel. You know, me with my rainbow pocket square, that is that guy right there. But I've manifested him in a certain way in that channel art to then, in terms of the law of attraction, it, not really in terms of the law of attraction, but just, I suppose, just generally based on my dreams and things like that, I've just kind of done it. But it manifests that, you see. And so it brings it towards me as I get closer to it. So it that fantasy, imagine you've got imagine you've got the unconscious up here and you've got consciousness down here. And and imagine I'm kind of going along in my life here. I'm getting older and older. And this fantasy idea that I've had, whether it's unconscious to me or not, is coming down here and I'm going up in age. And then we get a balancing in which uh, maybe 40, maybe 50, maybe 60 you equalize and that fantasy has become reality expressed as um, an individualized personality that is a mana personality. Um, a mana in the Maori tradition is like magical power. It's a, I've talked about it before. Mana essentially in scientific language is the genetic similarity to your parents or your, well, you're your the same sex parent, we could say. And this is kind of alluded to in the Popol Vuh, where the uh, father uh, basically spits onto the hand of, uh, I forgot a name actually in the Popol Vuh, but it's a, a sort of a daughter of one of the the um, people of um, Shabalba, one of the, the people in the hell realm of the... Of the um, it's not the Maui, sorry, it's this, this is a different thing here, isn't it? What's what's the Popol Vu? That's the, the the Maya tradition, isn't it? But anyway, it, it relates. Yeah, sorry, it relates to that. I'm, I'm doing an openness thing again. I'm linking all these things up. But when uh, that father spits on the hand of the the um, the daughter, that's representative of um, the the mana being transferred. You see, there's uh, that. In turn, that action of, of the father, the head on the tree, spitting on the hand of the daughter. Uh, not his daughter, but one of the daughters of, of one of the lords of Shibolba, um, then makes her pregnant. And that is representative of this kind of transfer of mana, of this magical power that is essentially a genetic closeness to your, let's say, I'm a man, to my father. And then what happens in the mana personality, this is why it's called the mana personality, essentially, or this is a good reason why it could be called the mana personality, is you express wholeness in the mana personality by atoning with your father and getting to uh, the state in which you are an individualized person at the age of which obviously your father kind of um, was around when you were younger like you know like you know when he's like 40 or 50 or whatever you atone uh, with that, and then you become the father, essentially. And because you've got a genetic similarity with him, it's almost as if 
um, your expression of the Mana personality is not removed from him, it's not removed from your father, but it integrates a part of your father, of course, with also your unique traits that you have. So it's a genius idea. It's an idea that um, allows us to understand um, this kind of uh, gaining of a Mana personality from um, a father like, you know, a, a, the, the father, it's kind of, it, it's encased within the father. It, the, the mana personality is encased within the father, and then it's about pulling that out of the father, placing it into yourself, and atoning at that point of, um, of you know, when you're when you're a little bit older. But I forgot what I was relating the Popol Vuh to. Oh, the Maui tradition, yeah. So, in the Maui tradition, it is that genetic, well, we could say in modern scientific terms, it's the genetic similarity with your father and um, how you then become a part of your father. You see, in modern speech, we always say this, like, oh, I'm becoming my father, or oh, I'm becoming my mother. I'm, oh, God, I'm becoming like my mother. And yes, you are actually, genetically, you are very similar to your mother or your father. So, of course, you're going to take on board similarities from them, and then you're going to express them in an idea of a whole personality at 50 or 55 or whatever, and you do take on traits, and you do take on ideas, and um, the kind of uh, patterns in behaviour of your father or your mother, and you express that in your new individualised mana personality, and that is the mana. The mana is the little piece of genetic similarity that allows you to flower um, into an individualized personality, but that is, but that is not one hundred percent individualized. It's sort of based on um, an archetypal, oh, sorry, an instinctual hyphen archetypal um, kind of collective way of behavior that your father possesses in a certain dimension. So he possesses a certain. Uh, set of instinctual, differentiated instinctual traits, or instinctual compulsions um, that then you gain. And so it's a collective transfer. It's a transfer of magical power. It is exactly that. If we're talking about it in mythological terms, it's a transfer of magical power from the father to the son. And it's the son who then becomes the hero, overtakes the father, and then gains the mana personality at, at such an age. And so, the re sorry, not Zerino, but this shadowy-like figure is also, within him, is a part of my father. Within him, and it is very true, because when I look at him, there are, although he, he, when I've seen him in dreams and stuff, he, he looks nothing like my father. In fact, he looks really cool and, you know, all this, but... Um, Certainly, in some instances, I've seen him in dreams. And he wear, and he, one time he wore. Holy shit! Oh my god! In a dream? Oh my god! About six months ago, he was wearing a waistcoat and a tie, and he had a grey beard, slightly grey beard, like stubble, and he had like a grey hair. But you know, like those old people, well, not old people, but you know, like those people who are like 45 or 50, who are really cool, and he had the hair like up like that, and he had like grey hair, but it was spiked up, and it was really cool, like I have it now. Okay, that's weird, but it is, it's like I have it now. And he had a waistcoat on, and I've just realised the banner to my channel, I have a bloody waistcoat on in it, and my hair's done up. So it is, it's been placed in reality, like, I, I was unconscious of that partly as well. I mean, I knew what I was doing partly with putting that in there, but I didn't realise fully. Jesus. Anyway, so it is like that, and you become that. Your your psyche kind of makes you become that over a long time period. And this is done naturally, in natural individuation, or it's done consciously in conscious individual. Well, it's still done naturally, even in conscious individuation to a degree. Um, but within conscious individuation, you have, when you get to conscious individuation, you have more of a consciousness centered around, um, obviously, the self and realization of the self and the total personality. Um, but you also have kind of some consciousness towards, or you may have some consciousness towards the psyche itself and its patterning processes if you so look into it and things like that. Um, so it, it, it's genius. That's what the psyche does. That's how it flows, how it comes up, how it keeps going and how it integrates an individual. 
Uh, it's absolutely marvellous. Um, so it is, of course, my job at the moment, and it is the job of any anyone, really, to find out the what's happening in fantasy and where this is leading you and what your natural tendencies are, what I would say your natural instinctual tendencies, and then go with that and flower it out and try and keep rounding yourself off, keep rounding yourself off. As if you're, I suppose as if you've got like a big ball that you need to kind of shave down and create into a smaller ball that's more kind of suitable for what you require. Now you've got this big ball and you don't need all this stuff around it. Or no, this is a perfect example. You've got an ice block. You've got an ice block and you want to carve something out of the ice block. Now, uh, I believe it was Lao Tzu or um, some, it was one of the Taoists anyway, who said that the, the the figure within the ice block or the figure within the stone block it wants to come out of the of the of the block it it's already implied within the block so as you're before you're even cutting it the 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 it's a very very complex idea it's very hard to understand and it seems quite illogical when you think about it to to some degree but the the figure is trapped within the, within the stone or within the ice block. And when you're cutting it out, it's almost as if it's all the potential of the figure is already in there, already cemented in that block. And when the person cuts it out, you're actualizing that potential that was already there and that already could be actual actualized. It is a complex idea. But it's interesting nonetheless because the potential for a certain figure out of a stone block is, is obvious. You know, it, every stone block that you have, if you've got a, a carver of stone, that carver of stone can see the potential in that block for for that for uh, a lovely figure of uh, uh, a Greek god to appear out of it by them cutting it. Um, so you've got that, and, and and that's what it is. That's kind of. Um, what it's about it's about finding that in the in the fantasy and then bringing that forward into reality um into the whole personality um and then being able to obviously then uh be a representation of that you are that individualized personality um and so that's it's a very very interesting idea it's a very very interesting idea that, that, that we can do this that we can move into this and that we can make that potential actualized um now i don't know quite what i was what the route i was going on there because i swear that i've, I've missed something off because i went on to the whole ice block situation and then kind of forgot where i was at before then but sometimes that's the case because you know i'm like i just talk 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 it's crazy um but no i think that's that sums it up really and it is about that. It's about you've got this block and you're carving it out and you're carving, you're seeing the potential of this figure and then you're actualizing it. Um, and uh, it's about going through, it's about refining, refining your personality over the years, over the years, over the years. And as I say, this from, from the viewpoint of the psyche, this is done automatically. It's not a process that you consciously have to involve in because, of course, the psyche has to create fantasies and those fantasies get bestowed to you um in ideas and then those ideas you just have a compulsion to do you the ideas spontaneously arise and then you you go along with the ideas and that is kind of like a product of your psyche based of course on the stimulus of the external world as well around you it's partially because of that um but it's actually that your brain uses the stim uh, stimuli of your environment processes it in your uh, setting of your certain differentiated um, brain and your differentiated ability to uh, to actually partake in cognition and things like that, and also the differentiated instinctual compulsions you have in your brain. I've talked about this before. But what all that information does is it gets collated into your brain, your brain processes it, and then imagine that you're in your unconscious as these these things work in these archetypes, these instinctual compulsions, they, based on the information that is received from the outside world, 
They kind of structure fantasies and then they bestow the fantasies to you in dreams and things like that. And even if you're unconscious of those dreams, those dreams, as it's been found out scientifically, affect your behavior in one way or another. And also certain ideas spring up that very well may be a product of those fantasies that then compel you to do certain things and direct your, your life in certain ways. And so that there is the process of circambulation and the process also towards individuation in which uh, you are kind of almost directed by these ideas and these compulsions that you have towards that uh, thing anyway, regardless of whether you try and actively manifest or anything that we could say in the law of attraction. Um, because it has to be like that, otherwise nothing would, would get done. When we think, Jung talks about this, and this is a powerful idea for you to understand what I've just said in a more simpler way. Jung says in the interview, I think it's a face-to-face -face interview, or it might be the Great Minds of the 20th Century interview, it's one of them anyway. He says that, to the interview, all of this around me right now was once fantasy. The table, you know, the, the lights, this, that, the other, the houses, all that sort of stuff. It was all fantasy. And so it was bestowed to someone as a fantasy, as an idea, as an idea from a fantasy. Because they may have kind of envisaged it as a fantasy in their mind. And then they've got an idea for the blueprint of a house and they've, they've kind of structured it and stuff. And so then they've created the house in reality. Now, that is partially unconscious because that's a fantasy. Obviously, the brain, what the brain's done is it's looked at the, the surroundings around it and it's processed that information. And then it, in the form of a subjective fantasy, it's bestowed that fantasy to the individual because it's based on the brain unconsciously organizing all of those things that it sees in reality into a creative pursuit that could that that then that individual can go and go away and do and so that's how powerful the unconscious brain is and so it does that and then it bestows the fantasy that is organized in a certain way from the memories that they've had in the external world then that person gets the idea, they go away, they actualize it. And that person then becomes something like an architect or whatever, whatever it may be, you know, and whatever they do. And, and that is uh, an instinct. That is the instinct for constructivism. And that is an instinct working within the brain and, and working within fantasy to compel that individual in a certain way. And they become it either unconsciously individuated, naturally individuated, or consciously individuated, and they get to that wholeness of personality quite naturally, quite without doing anything, without trying to manifest. And it's the same with me. Even though I'm quite conscious of the things going on in my psyche and what I can perceive and what can happen, um, I'm unconscious of things working in me that, of which the psyche is doing that are leading me down, leading me down little paths through dreams and then behavior based on those dreams and uh, direction of, of behavior based on those dreams and things like that. And things that I'm seeing in the external world and fantasies that are coming up and bestowing me ideas. Um, those things are working unconsciously in me to take me in a certain direction that maybe I'm not fully aware of. So it, it's genius. I mean, it's young was a bloody genius. How the hell did he know this stuff? How the hell? It's not possible. It's not possible. He couldn't have known. How could he have known? The only reason I know is because I have his books to be able to know. If I didn't have his books, there's no way I'd know this stuff. I'm an idiot. I'm a bloody idiot. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's genius. It's genius. I just, I, 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 how the hell did he know this? It's not possible. God, it, it's just... It's just not possible that he knew this stuff. The level of introspection, the level of understanding that man must have been at. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But there we go. That's how it is. It's God, it's mental. It's mental. Of course, as I've talked about, socialization kind of plays its role in terms of the things around you, actors, 
um, stimuli for obviously the differentiated brain to act in a certain way and to to draw up certain fantasies and to have certain ideas. So of course, socialization, although I may have said it subtly in the past or indirectly in the past as not really counting for that much, I don't really think that, to be honest, upon hindsight, because I think that socialization does count for a certain amount. Um, but generally, it's this differentiated differentiation in the brain that lends people towards a certain directed behavior um, that that then means that they they structure things in a certain way and their unconscious mind structures things in a certain way to go down a certain path. But I don't think socialization counts for nothing. Um, I think really it is it's a it's a it's a a factor in the process. Let's say it's a factor in the process. Um, so anyway, I'll leave it there. So all I would say, just very briefly, based on the expansive personality, if you've got one, is just follow it as best you can and and read what you want to... Like, for example, in the sense of intellectual... I'm looking up there because I've got my books. Um, in the sense of intellectual curiosity, read what you want to read and enjoy the intellect and enjoy going down the routes that you want to go down. Um... I would say that in terms of eccentricity, there's not a lot I can say on that. I, all I could say from my own experience of being quite eccentric is just embrace it the best you can. Um, you're going to feel kind of like an outsider a lot of the time or sometimes. Luckily for me now, I don't feel as much of that because I'm I, I kind of am slightly more accepting of it. But years ago, I felt terribly like an outsider. I felt terribly like unaccepted I felt terribly like I, I, I've got too much it's too much for me this personality uh all the rest of it but I think you can just do the best you can and there are all always going to be times you're going to feel like your personality is a little bit too much for, for others because the fact is unfortunately your personality will be too much for some people and there will be some people who just can't cope with it and the best thing to do is just be yourself and if those people can't cope with the personality, then you're just going to go your separate ways anyway. That's just going to happen naturally. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. It's just that some personalities don't click. A lot of personalities I've found with experience do click a lot more than I thought, than I first thought. Um, I was a little bit stupid on that or ignorant on that. I thought that maybe more personalities um, wouldn't click with me or with other kind of expansive personalities or other variants of, of different personalities uh, than, than I was thinking, you know, I thought that maybe there wouldn't be that many, but actually a lot of people do uh, click. Um, it's quite a higher amount, quite a higher pe percentage of people who actually, although their personalities are very, very different, they can click. Or even if, let's say, there's people with quite similar personalities who you'd think would clash because they've got similar personalities. Sometimes those people can be great friends and stuff. So, you know, it's, it's higher than you think. But I'd just say just keep going with it and just accept to, to the best degree you can your eccentricity and don't lose it. Don't don't lose that eccentricity. Because for a long time, I was I, I went through this for about... God, six months or more, or a year of introspection just, you know, around these kind of things, these ideas, among other things that I was introspecting of, of on the, uh, at the same time, of course. But this was a big one for a while. Is my eccentricity solely a product of a neurosis? Or is my eccentricity solely a product of a neurotic tendency? I've introspected enough just about at this point, I feel, to say that no. To say that it is inherent, it is in part of it. Of course, maybe there's part of it that's socialized in terms of me being more eccentric because of being in a certain socialized setting. But part of it is inherent. It's innate. Um, it you could call it instinctual. You could call it um, having a genetic relationship with trait openness because we could clearly see how that could be the case in an empirical setting with regards to the fact that. Trait openness, as I've mentioned in this video, is relating to imagination and fantasy. And imagination and fantasy generally lend themselves. If, some, if someone's imaginative or uh, has a lot of fantasies and things like that, generally that lends themselves to being a bit more eccentric. So then we have a genetic kind of causal root, let's say, or correlation at least, of where that eccentricity comes from. And also I've realised that 
if I look back in photos of myself when I was younger, there's even photos of myself when I was like three or four or five where you can see a little bit of eccentricity in me. And so I think and and the socialization of that age it's not it's not enough to give me any level of eccentricity so i think that it it, generally there's a big part of it that's innate or um you know inherent with like within me um and so then you can you can atone more on that front as well because you can think well no it isn't like something that's been socialized as a bad thing or a neurotic tendency or something that's terrible it's that's the way you are and and so you accept that and you can accept that when you say that's the way you are you know um and 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 then that allows you to move forward in in some regard and it allows you to overcome any real disintegration did not disintegration again we've, we've we've fallen into that trap i always say this i always say disintegration it feels like it's kind of disintegrating i don't mean that i mean disintegration like hi d-i-s hyphen integration we could say uh it's just the way i say it it's terrible i say it in a terrible way um but some disintegration with your personality you'll overcome that a little bit because of such line of thinking um and also just generally over time and through experiences just accepting yourself a little bit more and growing into life as i like to say um so yeah, I mean, that about does it on the whole expansive personality thing. Again, we've gone over an hour. It's mental. We go over an hour so much now. I don't I don't get how we go over an hour. But um, anyway, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for watching, guys. Very, uh, very good video, as always. A pleasure to be on here. I love talking about uh, philosophy and psychology and things like that on here. Um, so yeah, I'm going to do whatever I'm doing today. Funnily enough, it is actually my birthday today. It's the 6th of February. Um, so I'm going to be drinking tonight. So that'll be good. Um, and, uh, we are, uh, what else are we doing? Well, you know, just chatting and all the rest of it, things like I've got a cigar to smoke. I've got my cigar over there to smoke. So, uh, I've got, well, I've got two, but actually I'm going to give one to one of my flatmates who I promised one of them to. So I'm going to have the thin one because that thin one looks cool um but yeah so i've got that to smoke later on 25 25 can you believe it mental 25 crazy half i'm halfway through my 20s that's that's crazy i don't i don't even want to think about it that much but still there we go that's what it is but i think i've there's a cliche uh in your 20s that you find yourself you try and find that's what your 20s are for you try and find yourself terrible cliche and people go out to the bloody um himalayas or wherever or the far east to find themselves and stuff you're really going to find yourself by going outside into the external world isn't that kind of contradictory because you're in here this is where you are so why would you go outside you know it's like that's that's all so you're going to go to the far east to find yourself it just doesn't make any sense if you want to find yourself you look at you introspect you look inside yourself um it's that quote from Carl Jung, he's probably his most famous quote, and I forget what it is now, because it's not my favourite quote from him, there's way better quotes, but that's his famous one, and it's, uh, he who looks outside dreams, he who looks inside awakes, it's something like that, that's, I'm paraphrasing a little bit there, but it's very close to that, um, and so, yeah, it is true. You know, you look inside to, to understand and find yourself. But I, I think I've done that to a good degree. I think I've, I think I've tackled the, the job of the 20s of trying to understand and find who you are. Um, and I think I'm, I'm getting there. Um, and I think I've probably done it to a degree way higher than 98% of people out there. Um, 98% of young people <laughs> don't look into themselves quite as much as I do. So... I think that I've kind of, and of course, my interest in psychology have just lent, lent, lends itself to that anyway. Um, but no, I think I've done that. So I'm happy with that. Um, although you, there's always that kind of feeling of, have I done enough or could I do more and all that? But, you know, we're not going to get into that. I think I've done enough. I think I've understood myself in a, a well-rounded setting. And I think now it's more of a case of just living and just, and just, uh, doing my work, doing the work that needs to be done. That's my task now. 
because now I've been into the unconscious for a good while and I am still, of course, I still do dream interpretation and things like that and fantasies and, uh, you know, active imagination. But I think I've really had my full time of going into the unconscious. I think that my big uh, kind of, I was going to say outburst, but that's not the right word. My big kind of foray into the unconscious, I think that's kind of drawing to a close. Um, and it's been an interesting kind of two to three years, really, if, we, if we're including spirituality and stuff, probably just over three years or around the three year mark. Um, it's been interesting and it's taught me a lot. And I've been to places that, oh God, like like Alan Watts said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the phrase that Alan Watts said, in spirituality, I've been to places that I never thought I would go to and all that. He says something like that anyway in one of his talks. And it's very true, and I understand what he means by that now, because Jesus, the places I have been to, in my own mind, in mystical experiences, in things like that, I mean, in dreams, God, my God, in dreams, Jesus, places I've been to in dreams. So um, I think I understand that now, and I, I think that it's time that um, my spirit comes forth, let's say, and uh, and I, I get on and I do the work and I... Uh, and I, I try and understand myself in a different dimension, in a more, as I would term it, an extroverted realist dimension. Um, although saying that, of course, I'll still be, um, I'll still be doing my dreams and stuff. But um, no, so it's it's very interesting, and uh, it, yeah, I think it's okay. I think for taking stock, reflecting, I think where I am at twenty five, that's how it is. That's always how it's going to be. Well, whatever you are, wherever you are in life, at whatever time, that's how it is. You don't need any more of a comment on it than that. That's how it is. And if you don't like it, then you have to change something. If you do like it, then you have to say, well, you know, well done, you know. And then you think, well, let's move forward with whatever we're doing next. So I'm going to leave it there. It's actually quarter to one, so I'll probably probably get some lunch now. Uh, I've not had any breakfast. At, well, I had a little bit of cookie dough. Yeah, <laughs> probably not the best thing to eat for breakfast. But we get these little cookie dough things from Tesco, right? And they're, you're meant to bake them in the oven, but we don't bake them. Well, I don't bake them. I don't really think the others do, actually. Maybe, one of, maybe uh, Kate baked one of hers one time. Anyway, so um, I just eat it out of a pack but it's so high in saturated fat um so anyway i had a bit of that but <laughs> this is not not a breakfast is it but hey ho the life of the student that's what that's what it is so i'll leave it there guys thank you very much for watching hope you enjoyed the video and uh, i will see you in the next one so see you very soon guys mm -hmm.